Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark. We're in James chapter 5. We're going to be starting in verse 16 this lesson. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, as we continue here in this study on praying for those that are afflicted, we get into verse 16, where James writes and he says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, this specific verse is used by the Catholic Church as scriptural evidence for the sacrament of confessing to a priest. Now, I'm not going to get into uh, the differences between the Catholic Church and Protestant, Protestant churches uh, concerning confession of sins and, and those kinds of things. But what I do want to do is look at this verse basically for what it says. So, it says here, we have, we have to understand that the confession of faults and the praying for one another has specifically to do with a person's desire to be healed and nothing else. This is what James says. He says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Why? For what purpose? That you may be healed. Now, <clears throat> it may imply that the reason why this person is sick is because of sin. And this may be the reason why confession is needed. But don't get the idea that we should start calling the elders and telling them all of our sins and then asking for prayers. This is not what James is trying to say. We have to be careful about telling others our sins because of the effects that telling them our sins will have on them and how they view us. Look, you get a, you get a cold or a flu or, you know, you break your leg or something like that. And, you know, you don't, you don't want to be calling for the elders of the church and have them come over and then start, you know, spilling out your guts about how you've sinned all day today and yesterday and all week and, and all these things and naming all these. No, you know what? This is not what James is saying. It's not, not that we, we, we shouldn't hang our, our dirty laundry out for everyone to see. <laughs> not a lot of Christians can handle hearing other people's sins. Paul warns us about this in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, where he says, Brethren, if a man, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So if we're, Paul saying, if we're called in a sense to uh, minister to someone who fall who who uh, who committed some sin and we're there to minister to them we need to be careful ourselves we need to watch ourselves and so that we're not taken up either by the same sin they committed or by some other sin um, so we have to be careful the effects of your sins on someone else could cause them to be tempted also. Now, listen, do not, absolutely do not magnify your sins or your past. Remember, it is not important who you are or what you have done. The only thing that's important is who Christ is and what he has done for us. Remember, say it, say it again. Don't magnify your sins or your past. 
It's not important who you are or what you've done in this life. It's more important who Christ is and what he has done for us on the cross. If someone comes to you and wants to tell you what they did, it is much better to tell them that you don't want to hear it and that they should go and tell it to God. I mean, because that's where it should go. They should, they should be going to God with their sins. If a, if, if a person has a need to tell you their sin instead of telling, instead of going to God, then there's something wrong with their understanding of sin and of forgiveness. Some people commit sins and, and they think it's horrible and they just got to go to someone who they, you know, a pastor or someone in the church or someone they trust who they, who they know is godly and they just have to go and tell it to somebody. Well, that shows it's a lack, it's a lack of understanding uh, of sin and of, uh, of, of the payment of sin that was made for them on the cross and of, and of God's forgiveness. I mean, they should be able to go to, don't, don't, don't they believe God is real? Don't they believe God is everywhere present? I mean, they can, they can pray to God. God hears them. And if you have a desire to hear people's sins, then there's something wrong with you and your relationship with God. If you have a, an inner desire to hear the faults of other people, then there's something wrong with your relationship to God. It's none of our business what other people do, the faults and the sins that others do. If you have directly hurt someone, then yes, you need to go to them and confess what you did and seek forgiveness from them. Yes. But other than that, no one else needs to know. Just take it to God. Remember, all sin, all sin is, is ultimately against God anyways. David sins with, with Bathsheba and then he kills Uriah, her husband. And what does is, what is David say in Psalm, 50, Psalm 51? He says, Un, you know, against thee and thee only have I sinned. All sin is against God eventually anyways. So he says here in uh, verse 16, confess your faults one to another. And this Greek word for confess is ex homologeo. And the prefix ex intensifies this Greek word. It means to freely and openly agree with God that what we just did was a sin. There can't be cleansing from sin if we don't think that we did anything wrong. If a person commits a sin, a lie or steal or whatever, whatever they do, hatred or anger, well, I was justified in that anger. I was justified in saying what I said to them. I mean, they hurt me. And, and, you know, and, you know if, if a person doesn't think that what they just did was a sin, then they're not going to go to God and confess it. And because of that, there's no cleansing. There's no cleansing from that sin. Because why? Because they're not ready to agree with God that what they just did or said was a sin. In our context here, in verse 16, confession of sin is coming from a sick person who desires to be healed. It can be physical sickness or mental sickness or emotional sickness. Again, it doesn't matter. It's just coming from a, a person who's, who has a, an infirmity and they want to be healed. And it says here, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, there are a multitude of different translations of this sentence. But it seems that most agree upon the translation of this, that it should say the supplication of a righteous man avails much in its working. Or it could also say the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 
And then the third way of, of saying this is the prayer of a righteous person has great powers as, as it is working. So it's again, it's not a hundred percent sure exactly how that sh how this phrase should be. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, uh, but it just it it means that when a when a godly person prays, it has great great power behind it. Now it says here of a righteous man. Now here is understood a person who is in right standing with God. It doesn't mean a perfect man, because no one's perfect. It says a righteous man. And this righteous man is, they are men of prayer. They are men of the word of God. They are humble, and they are given to the things of God. So when you get sick or have an infirmity or whatever, and you want to have someone pray for you, don't call up someone in your church who's half-hearted. Don't call up someone who's got, you know, half their heart is in the world and half their heart is in heaven. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they on Sundays they praise God and worship God, and the rest of the week, you know, they're out in the world, speaking like the world, looking like the world, all that kind of thing, and they're involved in the world. You know, it's not that. When you call someone to pray for you, you want someone that's going to pray. Someone whose heart is totally for God, for his word, for the Holy Spirit. It is prayers that come from a devoted heart that will have great effect. Now, verses 17 and 18 says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, here James is giving the example of Elijah. Now, here, why is he giving the example of Elijah? Well, Elijah is seen as one of the great men of the Old Testament. God used him greatly and allowed his name and his example to be remembered all down through history. But even Elijah was a man who was subject to like passions. Like passions means that he also had a sinful nature with all of its temptations. And he was subject to it, meaning that at times he also gave in to his sinful desires and sinful passions. Though Elijah, Elijah was a great prophet of God, yet he was still a man. And that's what James is saying here. James is saying, you know, we think that we have to be some holy and righteous person. And a lot of times when we think of the great men or, uh, or great women of the Old Testament, we think that they had holy lives, you know, and they, they walked around with a halo over their head and they had this aura around them. And, and they always prayed and they always, you know, thought wonderful thoughts and they never got angry or whatever. And, you know, that's not... <laughs> That's not true, because he's saying here, Elijah, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as he was just like us. When you think of Elijah and Elisha and, and Samuel and all these other great men of God and, and Joseph and all of them, look, they had, they had temptations too. And you know what? Sometimes they give, they gave into their temptations and they sin. And, and so, but here is a man who was subject to like passions, just like us, but he prayed fervently unto God and God did great things through, through Elijah. God stopped the rain for three and a half years. And what, Eli, what, what James is saying is, is, Hey, if God can do it for Elijah, he can do stuff for us too. God can answer our prayers, but he answers the prayers of what? 
a righteous man, a righteous woman, a righteous person, someone whose heart is set on God. And James is saying, if God heard and answered the prayers of an Old Testament sinner like Elijah, then God will do the same thing in the New Testament for, for New Testament sinners. The Old Testament passage of this account we see is in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1 and chapter 18 verses 42 to 45. So God, God, no man is righteous. No man is holy. No man is sinless. We're all sinners, but God answers our prayers. And, it, and you don't have to attain a certain amount of spirituality before God answers your prayers. He, as long as we have a heart that's after God, we have a heart that's dedicated unto him and his word. And we love him and he loves us. Well, you know what? We can pray. We can pray and God will answer our prayers. All right, we're going to continue on in verses, verse 19, next lesson. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.